Welcome. I'm Sebastian Mafud, and you're listening to WCAT Radio, the on-air wing of En Route Books and Media, bringing you the dulcet sounds of Catholic wisdom. Good evening, and welcome to another edition of Matara Magistra. My name is Jason Brunel, and I'll be, I'll be your host this evening, um, taking you through uh, from 8 o'clock until 9 o'clock uh, p.m. this evening. And before we begin, uh, let us start with a prayer in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful, and kindle within us the fire of your love. Send forth your Spirit, and we shall be recreated, and you shall renew the face of the earth. O God, who did instruct the hearts of your faithful people by sending into them the fire of your divine love, grant that we may be inspired by the Holy Spirit, that we may be filled with his gifts of knowledge, of wisdom, understanding, fortitude, piety, fear of the Lord, and counsel in order to manifest all of the fruits of the Holy Spirit and to bring the presence of Christ into the lives of every person we encounter this day and every day of our lives as we make every effort to fully cooperate with your grace and to be other Christs to every person we encounter. And this we ask in the name of the same Christ our Lord, and through the all-powerful and never-failing intercession of the Immaculate Virgin Mary. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. I was uh, reading through some articles uh, a few days, actually a few weeks back, and um, in preparation for this show, I had come across a series of, uh, or I came across one article, and it, it prompted the idea for uh, a show or a series of shows on this whole issue um, of of the the, the various um, scandals that are plaguing the church at this time. Um, those who may be listening to this show, I'm sure, are very familiar with um, the Dubia Cardinals, um, of whom uh, Cardinal Burke is probably the most prominent, certainly the most prominent for us here in America, as he is an American uh, cardinal. And um, he was, for a, very, uh, for, for a long time, the... Um, uh, he, was, uh, he held many prestigious uh, posts uh, within the church. Um, um, among them was uh, the, I believe he was the, uh, uh, the sp- spiritual director of sorts uh, for the, um, the, I believe it was the Knights of Malta, and, um, uh, which is a very prestigious organization within the Catholic Church. And... Um, and I, I believe um, I believe he was demoted uh, by Pope Francis uh, and um, removed from that uh, position. Um, but we know uh, Cardinal Burke is is, a, is is an amazing example of orthodoxy uh, of um, teaching the truths of the faith, um, adhering to the the official, authentic, all of the authentic teachings of the faith. Um, And he is truly a marvelous uh, voice in these times of of tremendous difficulty for the church, in these times of great, great confusion. Um, 
with uh, with Pope Francis uh, making statements uh, and assertions uh, regarding the faith that leave many questioning what the authentic teaching of the church is in many different areas. Um, Pope Francis has come out with assertions that uh, on one occasion he stated no one can be condemned forever. Uh, uh, And and, um, when further pressed on the issue, he, uh, he, he, he provided an explanation of of spiritual annihilation that um, that basically it's a you now we, we all know that for 2,000 years based on Christ's based on the, the very teachings of Christ Jesus our Lord and Savior himself we all know very well uh, Christ himself spoke more about the fires of Gehenna than any other person or author in sacred scripture uh, so it, clearly, our Lord uh, makes it very, very clear that that for those who uh, refuse to be obedient to the Eternal Father, uh, for those who who refuse to to cooperate with with God's eternal law of of divine love, to love God with one's whole heart, soul, strength, and mind, and to love one's neighbor as oneself. And granted, we will all fall short because we are sinners, of course. But to at at least acknowledge that our Lord is, you know, our Lord did state, be ye perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. And it 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 is the striving to be perfect. It is the recognition, the recognition that, pardon me, it is the recognition that we are called to participate in the divine family life of the most holy trinity through, with, and in Jesus Christ himself. This is awesome. The vocation to which we have been called by Christ uh, it's just incredible. So to to be called to such an exalted vocation presupposes that we live in a manner that is becoming and befitting uh, that uh, which is which is in accordance with that vocation. To be the adopted children of the Father. To be the the the. Uh, adopted brothers and sisters of Jesus Christ our Lord, um, it, it entails that we live a life that is that is appropriate to that of the children of God and to the brothers and sisters of Christ. Um, so yes, we are called to perfection. Um, granted, we will never attain it in this life. Uh, well, yeah, actually, that's a, that's a, that's a question that should be reserved for uh, the uh, probably for a, a, a Carmelite scholar uh, who, who uh, someone like Father Thomas Dubé uh, I don't believe he himself is a Carmelite but he certainly is a scholar um, uh, and is, is a marvelous uh, brilliant gifted tremendously gifted um, uh, scholar um, and, uh, on, this, on the spiritual life and uh, on Saint um, Saint uh, Teresa of Avila and Saint John of the Cross, the two masters, the two doctors of the spiritual life, and um, and he would uh, certainly be able to tell us more about the call to perfection and whether or not perfection would ever be a possibility in this life. We certainly know as Catholics that. Uh, there are the from from the spiritual writers and those who have undergone these things and experienced these various levels of um, of spiritual union uh, the 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 first stage of, of purgation the purgative way uh, the second stage of illumination 
the illuminative way. And then the uh, third and final stage of transformation or the transformative way or the unitive way. Um, and those are the stages um, spoken of by both uh, St. Teresa, uh, who explains them in her masterpiece, The Interior Castle, um, or The Interior Mansions, and all of those marvelous books. But we want to uh, get back to the original question. In this time of great confusion in the church, um, and when there, is, when there, are, there are so many uh, voices, uh, secular voices, uh, the three chief enemies of our soul, the world, the flesh, and the devil. Um, and there, is, there, 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 there certainly is no shortage of, of people, places, and things And Satan himself whispering, you know, using every possible means to, to discourage us, to dissuade us, to confuse us, um, especially sowing the seeds of confusion and doubt. And, and now we have, and of course, of course, without question, we know, we know with regard to this whole issue of Pope Francis, Pope Francis is the Holy Father, and, and we absolutely uh, pledge our absolute fidelity to the Holy Father. Uh, we pray for the Holy Father uh, every day. Um, we, we, we keep him in our prayers. Uh, for those of us who pray the rosary daily, uh, we pray for him every single day. Uh, we pray for him in the Liturgy of the Hours, uh, daily Mass. He is prayed for daily by the Universal Church. And we must continue to pray in a very special way for him and, um, and for this situation in the Church. But we know, we know, and it, we, when we can no longer avoid uh, the, the very strange statements that, that he has been making. And... Um, Initially, when he was first elected and when he began to say things that it, it, it certainly caught people off guard, that he, was, he, he seemed to speak off the cuff uh, much more so than any other previous pope. Uh, and, and that was something that the, uh, certainly the, the Vatican press office was not prepared for. <laughs> so that, that was quite new for them. And uh, they had to be uh, they realized uh, they had to be on their toes, and Francis was going to keep them on their toes. Um, and Pope Francis has said some some truly beautiful things and has offered some marvelous reflections, um, but we cannot deny the reality that there have been some very serious issues that have been raised throughout the course of his continued pontificate, and that he has he himself has uh, provided some teachings that have been very seriously ambiguous and confusing, um, if not heretical. And um, so we know, first off, there were, the, there were five cardinals, uh, among, uh, the most famous of whom, probably, for, for us Americans anyway, was a cardinal, a Leo Raymond Cardinal Burke, and um, and they uh, are known as the Dubia Cardinals. Um, I believe two of them have, have since passed, since the original uh, question. The, the word Dubia is Latin for doubt. And so these Cardinals were being very sincere in their efforts to clarify what specifically Francis meant uh, and this was this was um, in re this was a reaction to the document Amoris Laetitia, uh, the joy of love, and um, and there in this document um, there were many beautiful, wonderful things in this document, but there were also many things. There was one chapter in particular that that many 
many individuals found to be very, very seriously um, uh, compromised. Uh, um, and um, it took some time for, for people to kind of wrap their heads around some of the things that were being stated in, that, in, in one particular chapter. And um, basically, I wish I had my... Well, I came across... Well, so we know that the, the Dubia Cardinals asked a series of questions, and they, they wanted to make this as simple as possible uh, for the Pope. Um, and they simply... And so in order to do that, they... they they basically, based on what had been written in Amoris Laetitia, they prepared uh, a, a, a letter with, um, with a series of, of question, yes or no uh, questions with that, that would require simple, simple yes or no answers. Um, and those questions, um, let's see. The very first question, dubium one, it is asked whether, following the affirmation of Amoris Laetitia, uh, numbers 300 to 305, it has now become possible to grant absolution in the sacrament of penance and thus to admit to Holy Communion a person who, while bound by a valid marital bond, lives together with a different person more uxorio, in a, in a marital way, without fulfilling the conditions provided for by familiaris consortio, uh, number 84, and subsequently reaffirmed by uh, reconciliatio et penitentia, uh, number 34, and sacramentum caritatis, Number 29, can the expression in certain cases found in note 351, number 305, of the exhortation Amoris Laetitia be applied to divorced persons who are, who are in a new union and who continue to live, quote, more uxorio, unquote. Um, so the question is being asked, is it possible now to grant within the, within the sacrament of penance, within the, in the confessional, uh, is it possible to grant uh, reca, to, to, to grant a forgiveness uh, to a person who is now living uh, in a state, uh, basically living in a marital way with, with a person who is uh, not... They're not their spouse. Uh, th this is a very, very, uh, a very complicated situation. Um, essentially, it seemed as though Francis was Pope Francis in in that document, Morris Laetitia, was stating that. Um, we need to take a new pastoral approach. Uh, we need to, uh, uh, and it, 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 it was very confusing. On the one hand, it seemed as if he was saying, well, nothing doctrinally has changed. However, on a, you know, from a purely pastoral perspective, um, we need to really focus on the issue of, quote-unquote, accompaniment, um, this whole pastoral notion of accompaniment, pastoral accompaniment, so pastorally accompanying these individuals who were married in the church initially. Okay, a man and a woman got married. They were married in the church. They, they say they had children, maybe two children husband and a wife, um, the husband um, uh, starts, uh, the husband has an affair with uh, his secretary, and he decides to leave his wife, and uh, he, leaves, he leaves his family, and he 
moves in with his um, with his secretary, and um, they may or may not. Uh, now he he does file for divorce, civil divorce, and um, so he's filing for a civil divorce from his wife, to whom he is technically still married and forever will be married because it is the official teaching of the church, and the and it and it is the teaching of the church because it is the teaching of Christ that marriage is indissoluble. Marriage cannot be dissolved. Once, once, once two people are united, what God has united, let no man divide. No, no human person can undo a union that God establishes and fixes and creates and it simply cannot be cannot be undone um, Christ our Lord himself um, when the scribes and the Pharisees uh, in, in an effort to trip him up uh, posed the question to him um, you know well Moses uh, granted uh, provisions for uh, for divorce uh, you know is can, is, is divorce a possibility? Hoping that, knowing that, regardless of how, whether whether his response was yes or no, um, they could use it against our Lord. Um, given that, uh, originally, uh, of course, everybody knows that divorce was forbidden originally, and that um, uh, because of the the hardness of the hearts of, of the people. Uh, Moses was given permission to 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 allow for uh, exemptions uh, exceptions and, and to uh, so basically it was, it was an attempt to trip our Lord up and um, uh, but our Lord brought in 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 in, in his answer to that question he, he literally went back to the very beginning and he said. In the beginning, God created them male and female, which, by the way, is uh, a marvelous uh, truth uh, that we can reflect upon uh, with regard to the additionally confusing issue of um, of gender dysphoria that that is now in vogue uh, and with people claiming that it is possible to be gender fluid and that uh, there are no, it, it is no longer the case that there are two genders. Uh, it's, there's you know, no longer simply male or female, but any number of um, possible, you can be gender fluid according to certain persons and even Facebook has a, uh, I think uh, 50 some odd different gender preferences available nowadays. So, but our Lord makes it very clear. He who is the way, the truth, and the life states very clearly in the beginning, God created them male and female. Um, that is why uh, a man leaves his father and his mother and is joined to his wife. And the two become one. And what God has united, let no man divide. And we have there a beautiful answer to the question of divorce. Is divorce a possibility? No, it is not. It is not a possibility. Hence, we have the magisterium of the church, which essentially can be defined as the bishop's or the the, pope, the the bishops in unison with the Pope uh, teaching the truths of the faith. And it has been a long-standing, uninterrupted teaching uh, by our Catholic Church that, uh, that uh, marriage is, a ref- is, it is meant to reflect uh, sacramentally uh, the love that Christ has for his church. Um, and the 
reality of the church as simultaneously we, we, we can think of the church as the bride of Christ, which it is. It's not simply a metaphor. It's a reality. The church is the bride of Christ, but the church is also the body of Christ. And right there, we see the beauty and the reality of the example that human, or the, 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 basically the, the, the union between Christ and his church is to really serve as the template and, and the, the, the goal for every couple who enters into the sacrament of holy matrimony. They are to look to Christ for the example, the example of seeing, just as Christ embraces the church as his mystical bride, so Christ is the bridegroom and the church is his bride. And she, at the end of time, after her purification, will ultimately be without spot or wrinkle. And Christ takes his mystical bride to himself and the two become one, such that the mystical bride, the bride of Christ, which is his church, is, is, is truly his own mystical body. And this reality pertains just as much to the married couple and, to, and should pertain just as much to every married couple as it does to Christ and his union with his church. That every husband, every bridegroom, should take his wife as his mystical bride and should take every every bridegroom should take his bride to himself to the point where the two become one and the bridegroom can refer to his wife as his own body and being the body soul composites that we are we can get into the theology of the body and the beauty of the theology of the body left to us by John Paul. It's such a marvelous reality that the twinfold purpose of, of human love and the highest expression of human love is the, the marital embrace. Uh, the sacrament of holy matrimony is the uh, is the quintessence of human love it, it's really the the highest form of human love and the two in becoming one uh through the marital embrace become three uh in that love is fruitful so the the twinfold goal of 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 marriage is is love and life and, and, and hence the, the twinfold criteria for every, for every uh, conjugal act, for every uh, authentically, uh, morally licit sexual embrace, uh, the two criteria that must be met uh, are basically the, the love, the unitive, and life, the procreative. Uh, every authentically conjugal act uh, must be truly, um, it must be an, an authentic and true expression of love between the partners uh, in that it must be exclusive between the husband and the wife, um, no other parties. Uh, if I am married if, if, if I enter into a, uh, a, the, sa the holy sacrament of matrimony, when, I should say when, I entered into the holy sacrament of matrimony with my wife, I married my wife, I didn't marry anybody else. And it was exclusively to my wife that I pledged my unconditional love and my fidelity. And so it is to her alone. I gave the gift of myself, the gift of everything I am and have, 
I gave to my wife. And it was an exclusive gift to her and to her alone. Uh, therefore, I cannot give a gift that has already been given. Uh, I can't turn around. And, and, and the, thing to, the thing to remember is that we are body-soul composites. Um, we are not... Um, some people like to think of the human person as a, an essentially spiritual entity who, uh, in court, who, who, who is uh, kind of trapped in a body and kind of uses the body as a car. Uh, like, just like we, you know, we hop into our car as a, as a vehicle, uh, it, it serves a function of, of getting us from point A to point B. But, and, and, and then we can you know, get out. And once we've arrived at our destination, we can get out of our car and separate ourselves from our car. And the car, you know, ceases to be an ex- – the car really isn't essential to who we are. It's simply a vehicle. And, and I think a lot of people have adopted that mindset with regard to our bodies. It's a form of really – it's a form of Manichaeanism. Uh, the Manichaeans – uh, and and St. Augustine, was, was, he w- went through many phases before his uh, entire conversion to Christianity. But uh, for a period of time there, he was Manichaean. And the Manichaean idea is that it is possible to, uh, well, it's really more of a, there's a, there's a, there's a it's, it's a dichotomous binary, essentially. You have the body uh, in the world of matter, of which the body is a part, and that's so. There, there's a there's a good God who is the God of the of, a good God who is the God of spirit and soul and thought and idea, and then there's a evil God who is the God of matter and material and bodies and everything that's. Uh, Corporeal. All right. So basically, the it, it's it's a it's there's a there's a fundamental split, and and the good God is the God of the the world of spirit, and the bad God is the God of matter, and, and so this is the Manichaean worldview, and um, so anything that would be uh, anything that would involve uh, the body um, or Pleasures having to do with with uh, sensual experiences of the body of the flesh um, would all kind of fall into that uh, from that perspective. They all kind of fall into that um, evil category where they would not be considered uh, acceptable or or, or g- good. Uh, and we we as we as Christians know that that is simply not the case. And how do we know that? We know that because God is the author of everything. God created everything that is. If it exists, God created it. God is its author. And everything that God created is good, including matter. Um, And even if God the Father is a pure spirit, even if God the Father does not possess a material body, um, he did nonetheless create the material world, the, the material cosmos. And the material cosmos is good because it is part, it is God's creation. God cannot create anything that is not good. Everything God creates is good because it is created by the all-good God. And therefore, all matter and all material experiences or experiences that are... People, as as human persons, as as body-soul composites, we uh, have bodies, and our bodies are fundamentally good. The problem, and I think a lot of people, because of the because of the the um, the, pro- the prohibitions uh, placed on 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 um, certain um, sexual activity that is outside the um, 
outside of the context of marriage, I think some people can sometimes fall victim to the mentality that um, that certain bodily experiences are fundamentally wrong or evil, um, that the experience of being physically attracted to, to uh, another human being, um, uh, you know, of the, of, the, of the opposite sex, that that, that that attraction in and of itself is, it almost becomes, for some people, um, synonymous with sin. Um, and, and that should, really should not be. Uh, because it's a completely natural, normal thing. The problem, and the, I think the reason that happens is because of the effects of original sin that we still must contend with. And that's an unfortunate reality that every single one of us must contend with, the unfortunate consequences uh, of original sin, which are, uh, to list them, uh, with the first and foremost, uh, obviously, is the, the, um, well, the, the, there are four fundamental relationships that are severed. There's the relationship between um, the human person and his creator. Uh, so that, 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 that's, that's the most dire consequence of original sin. And that is precisely what baptism uh, uh, rectifies. Uh, ba- the baptism, the sacrament of holy baptism, is received by the infant um, in order that the infant might be restored to God's divine friendship, so that the indwelling presence of the Holy Trinity might be restored to that child, and uh, thereby putting an end to the privation or the privation being defined as the lack of something that ought to be. Uh, So in in the case of um, baptism, um, the privation of of, of being born in a state of original sin is being born without the indwelling presence of the Most Holy Trinity as the soul of one's soul. Baptism rectifies that situation, by enabling the Holy Spirit to take up residence in the soul of the child um, using the, the form and the matter um, of, of the, using the, the form of the Trinitarian formula and using the matter of, of water and, um, and interestingly enough, any person, anybody, it does not have to be a priest or, 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 or even a deacon, any person can baptize simply because of the radical necessity of baptism. Um, it is the only, it is the only uh, way that the church, um, we, we, granted, we know that, that God is, you know, in our times, in our times in particular, we have a special guarantee, a special kind of underscoring and affirmation, if you will, of God's divine mercy. In that, um, we have those beautiful revelations of our Lord Jesus Christ uh, as the divinely merciful Savior uh, to Saint Faustina, who our Lord deems. His sec- the secretary of his divine mercy. And he specifically assigned to her the task of, of basically sharing with the world uh, and, and re-evangelizing to the world the truth of God's infinite mercy. Um, and there are, there are a few incredible, just absolutely astounding statements that are made uh, by our Lord that, that, uh, that were written down by uh, Sister Faustina, St. Faustina, in her diaries that have been compiled into the one book, which is, I believe it's entitled uh, Divine Mercy in My Soul. 
and um, uh, published by the Marians of the Immaculate Conception. Um, and uh, that is just truly an exceptional, exceptional work, um, not only chronicling the life of, of St. Faustina and the, the incredible sufferings that she endured, uh, along with the incredibly amazing uh, uh, revelations uh, and, and, and mystical experiences that she experienced. Um, and you will see that in the life of almost uh, every canonized saint. Uh, there, there, is, there are those two elements of radical, radical suffering, heroic suffering, um, and, and it's not suffering for suffering's sake. That's, I think that's one of the things that's so often misunderstood. The suffering is the suffering of love. The suffering is a salvific suffering, and the, and the, the individual enduring that suffering is being asked specifically by our Lord to take on these additional sufferings in order to participate, <clears throat> excuse me, to participate more intensely in the, um, to cooperate more intensely in the, in Christ's perfect act of, of redemption. Um, that's one of the beautifully, that's one of the truly beautiful, it's really, that's the goal of human existence, so, to love God with your whole heart, soul, strength, and mind, and also to love your neighbor, well, in, in the Old Testament, to love your neighbor as yourself. So, of course, the, the, we think of the golden rule, you know, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And then they call it, I think they call it the silver rule, which is uh, don't do unto others as you would not want them to do unto you, uh, which is just, uh, and, um, but our Lord takes it to the next step. And um, that's, and, and, and we have, so, so we have the Old Testament, uh, the commandments, and then we have our Lord raising the bar. A new commandment I give you, love one another as I have loved you. Love one another as I have loved you. How did Christ love us? He loved us to the point of death. He loved us to death, literally. He died on the cross. And it wasn't just any death. It wasn't just a, you know, he died of a heart attack or died in his sleep. No, he died the most excruciating, most humiliating, most awful death conceivable. And not just that. It, it, and I, I often think, you know, we, we, look, at the, we look at the crucifixion and, and, and it, it really was, I mean, just all of the tortures that he endured um, consecutively. And yet, that's, that's purely the physical suffering. Then I think we have to, very rarely do, do people even talk about the, the, the emotional and mental suffering that he endured in being condemned to death um, or the humiliation that he endured. Um, and very, very rarely, do people talk about the spiritual suffering that our Lord endured in knowing? And it's a spiritual suffering that must have been on so many different levels. There had to have been the suffering of, of being abandoned by his father. Um, it is widely accepted that our Lord experienced throughout his life uh, as the second person of the Most Holy Trinity. He 
it would only be natural, it would only be appropriate to believe that he experienced the beatific vision even while he was a man living on this earth, that he had this intimate relationship with his father and did indeed have that intimacy of life with his father. We know how often he went off to pray, how often he would climb the mountains to pray. And the, just the metaphor of the mountain, of climbing the mountain, uh, you know, going up, having that mountaintop experience, climbing the mountain, being closer to his father in heaven, um, immersing himself in his father's creation, in his creation. All was created through him, Jesus Christ. All was created for him. Um, so, so immersing himself in his own creation uh, and, and that incredible love that he, that he and the Father shared uh, from which there, there, there came forth the, the third divine person of the Most Holy Trinity, the, the divine Spirit of God as the divine personification of the love. Again, that's the fecundity of the love between the Father and the Son. And, um, but the, so the pain of, of losing that vision of the Father during the crucifixion, during the whole process, sort of beginning at the end of the Last Supper, beginning, um, in the Garden of Gethsemane, where our Lord enters into the anguish that begins his passion. Um, but before we have to conclude the show, <laughs> I would like to uh, share with the article that I came across. Um, we started off the show talking about the controversial remarks that have been made by Pope Francis that have led to uh, <laughs> to say that it's led to confusion is to put it very mildly. It's led to tremendous confusion. And you have people, um, it's, it, you, there's the, I've, I've never seen such division in a church. Um, you have the, the pro-Francis pro-Pope Francis people lining up behind Pope Francis um, who, who are, you know, just because we, we know that Pope Francis has, uh, has come out in support of, uh, basically in Morris Letizia, Pope Francis comes out in support of individuals um, in any number of situations who who um, are living as husband and wife yet have not either either do not have the sacrament of holy of of of, of holy holy matrimony because they either are there could, it could be a situation of cohabitation. Uh, we know that Pope Francis came out and stated uh, publicly that um, certain couples uh, do have. Certain couples who are not married but who are living uh, more exorio, I believe it's the, uh, uh, living as husband and wife, more exorio, um, couples who are living as husband and wife but who have not entered into the Holy Sacrament of Matrimony, not even civilly. Uh, the Pope went so far as to say that, that many, many, some or many of those couples do have the sacrament, I mean, not sorry, they do have the, the, the graces of the sacrament of holy matrimony. And he shortly thereafter uh, questioned whether certain couples who were indeed sacramentally married, uh, he questioned the, the legitimacy of, 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 of actual marriages. So it was just very, very odd. So I came across this article, and I, I just had to share this because this is an article. Um, 
it appeared in The Catholic Thing. Um, it is by Elizabeth A. Mitchell, and the title of this article is The Dubia Were Answered. And I'm just going to read it because it's such a great article. Um, it's, very, it's relatively short, and, uh, but it's, it's fascinating. Um, it was uh, published on Saturday, May 11th of this year. And it begins, perhaps it was because Notre Dame in Paris was burning. Perhaps it was because the best place to hide something from view is in plain sight. Or perhaps it was because we look for power in wind, earthquake, and fire, but miss the, quote, still small voice, unquote, of God when he passes by. Taken from 1 Kings uh, chapter 19, 11 through 13. Whatever the reason, the world watched, read, and missed the answers to the dubia proposed by Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI in his April essay, quote, The Church and the Scandal of Sexual Abuse, unquote. In offering a three-part response to the crisis in the church, Pope Benedict indirectly answers the five dubia that Cardinals Bram Mueller, Kafara, Meisner, and Burke presented years ago to Pope Francis. The Pope Emeritus fulfilled a duty that Pope Francis has not, namely to maintain the bishops and all the faithful in the unity of the church's constant teaching on faith and morals. What did the Pope Emeritus say? He gives the church and the world an unequivocal no Yes, 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 and yes. Five questions, five answers. Dubium one. It is asked whether, following the affirmation of Amoris Laetitia, numbers 300 to 305, it has now become possible to grant absolution in the sacrament of penance and thus to admit to Holy Communion a person who, while bound by a valid marital bond, lives together with a different person, more exorio, in a marital way, without fulfilling the conditions provided for by familiaris consortio, number 84, and subsequently reaffirmed by reconciliatio penitentia, in number 34, and another document, can, this expre- can the expression in footnote 351 of the exhortation Amoris Laetitia be applied to divorced persons who are in a new union and who continue to live, quote, more uxorio, unquote, that is, in a marital way. Benedict's response, no. Quote, we run, no, this is, this is Pope Benedict, uh, Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI, um, in his April essay, essentially answering this first dubium. Quote, we run the risk of becoming masters of faith instead of being renewed and mastered by the faith. Let us consider this with regard to a central issue, the celebration of the Holy Eucharist. Our handling of the Eucharist can only arouse concern. What predominates? is not a new reverence for the presence of Christ's death and resurrection, but a way of dealing with him that destroys the greatness of the mystery. The Eucharist is devalued into a mere ceremonial gesture when it is taken for granted that courtesy requires him to be offered as family celebrations or on occasions, such as weddings and funerals, to all of those persons invited for family reasons. It is rather obvious that we do not need another church in our own design. Rather, what is required first and foremost is the renewal of the faith in the reality of Jesus Christ given to us in the Blessed Sacrament. And we must do all we can to protect the gift of the Holy Eucharist from abuse. That is a solid no to the question, can the expression in certain cases, found in 
footnote 351 of the Exhortation of Morris Laetitia be applied to divorced persons who are in a new union and who continue to live more uxorio. No, no, we cannot grant them forgiveness in the sacrament of reconciliation if they continue to obstinately live in a new union uh, as husband and wife with a new person, uh, never having ex- never having received a, a nullification of their first marriage, um, which is a process whereby a, a diocesan tribunal is convened by the bishop and um, canon lawyers are brought together to uh, very closely examine uh, the situation of a of a uh, of a, of a divorced, or, uh, I'm sorry, of a married couple who who uh, were married in the church, and they 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 interview both spouses uh, and ask both spouses to respond uh, as truthfully, as honestly as they can to any number of questions. Uh, to whether in the form of writing or, or orally, um, and various, uh, di- I'm sure there are uh, uh, canonical, uh, I'm, I'm certain there are canonical uh, regulations uh, that um, surround the whole process of, of um, seeking an annulment or the process of a diocese um, reviewing uh, the situation of spouses who are seeking an annulment. Um, and really, the only way an annulment could be granted would be if uh, it was determined that one or both spouses, um, at the time they entered into uh, the sacrament of holy matrimony, uh, if it was the case that, that one or both of the spouses uh, was not acting with either full knowledge or full consent of the will, um, if they were not acting uh, with full freedom, um, if there if there were any any number of circumstances that uh, if 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 there were if there was a pressure being exerted upon one or one or more of the one or one or more, one or both of the spouses, um, basically in order for a marriage to be uh, a true marriage, both spouses have to enter into it freely. Um, they both have to enter into it uncoerced. Uh, they have to enter into it with full knowledge of what the expectations of the Holy Sacrament of Matrimony entail, um, that it is a lifelong uh, commitment, um, that it is meant to be lived out, uh, as I stated at the beginning of the show, uh, the, the uh, using the image of, of Christ and his relationship to his church, which is his bride, uh, which ultimately is also his own mystical body. And that, in my estimation, is the ideal of holy matrimony. Christ uh, taking his mystical bride and, or I should say, Christ embracing his mystical bride as his own mystical body. That is the, the goal of, of all sacramental holy matrimony. So Benedict provides a no to the first dubium. No, we cannot grant absolution to those who have no intention of putting an end to a new relationship uh, with a new partner. Um, no, we cannot Allow, grant absolution and and subsequent subsequently allow permit that person to receive holy communion. No, so that is the first. And moving on with the article, trying to finish this before the show comes to an end. Dubium two, after the publication of the post synodal apostolic exhortation of Morris Laetitia, cited from number three hundred four, does one still need to regard as valid? The teaching of St. John Paul II's encyclical Veritatis Splendor, number 79, based on sacred scripture and on the tradition of the church on the existence of absolute moral norms that prohibit intrinsically evil acts 
and that are binding without exceptions? Benedict's response, yes. Pope John Paul II, now this, is, this again is Benedict, uh, Pope Benedict, Pope Emeritus, Benedict XVI speaking here. Yes, we do. Uh, we must insist, let's see here, based on sacred scripture and the tradition of the constant teaching and tradition of the church, we must insist on the existence of absolute moral norms that prohibit intrinsically evil acts and that are binding without exception. And Benedict's response is, quote, Pope John Paul II, who knew very well the situation of moral theology and followed it closely, commissioned work on an encyclical that would set these things right again. It was published under the title Veritatis Splendor and did indeed include the determination that there were actions that can never become good. He knew that he must leave no doubt about the fact that moral... I'm sorry, I'll repeat that. He knew that he must leave no doubt about the fact that the moral calculus involved in balancing goods must respect a final limit. Response, yes. Uh, we must insist on the existence of absolute moral norms that prohibit intrinsically evil acts and that are binding without exception. Dubium 3. After Amoris Laetitia, number 301, is it still possible to affirm, this is Dubium 3, after Amoris Laetitia, is it still possible to affirm that a person who habitually lives in, in contradiction to a commandment of God's law, as, for instance, the one that prohibits adultery, cited from Matthew uh, chapter 19, uh, verses 3 through 9, finds him or herself in an objective situation of grave habitual sin. So, is it still possible, after Amoris Laetitia, to affirm that a person who lives habitually in contradiction to a commandment of God's law, for instance, the law that prohibits adultery, that that person finds him or herself in an objective situation of grave habitual sin? Benedict's response, yes. And I quote, a society without God, a society that does not know him and treats him as non-existent, is a society that loses its measure. Western society is a society in which God is absent in the public sphere and has nothing left to offer it. And that is why it is a society in which the measure of humanity is increasingly lost. At individual points, it becomes suddenly apparent that what is evil and destroys man has become a matter of course. End of quote. Dubium 4. After the affirmations of Amoris Laetitia, number 302, on, quote, circumstances which mitigate moral responsibility, unquote, does one still need to regard as valid the teachings of Pope St. John Paul II's encyclical Veritatis Splendor, particularly number 81, based on sacred scripture and on the constant tradition of the church, according to which, quote, circumstances or intentions can never transform an act intrinsically evil by virtue of its object into an act, quote, unquote, subjectively good or defensible as a choice. So basically, the question is, do we still need to regard as valid John Paul's teaching that regardless of the circumstances or the intentions, uh, that there are certain objects that are always, well, basically, yeah, based on according to which circumstances or intentions can never transform an act that is intrinsically evil by virtue of its object into an act 
that is subjectively good or defensible as a choice? And Benedict's response is yes. So yes, we must still, after the affirmation of Amoris Laetitia, uh, based on circumstances which mitigate moral responsibility, does one still need to regard as valid the teachings of St. John Paul II's encyclical Veritatis Splendor? Yes, we must still regard as valid John Paul's teaching that no circumstance or intention can ever transform an objectively, intrinsically evil act into one that is somehow subjectively good. And that is, uh, and, and Benedict, Benedict states, quote, there are goods that are never subject to trade-offs. There are values which must never be abandoned for a greater value and even surpass the preservation of physical life. God is about more than mere physical survival. A life that would be a life that would be bought by the denial of God, a life that is based on a final lie, is a non life. End of quote. Wow. Dubium five. After Amoris Laetitia number 303, does one still need to regard as valid the teachings of St. John Paul II's encyclical Veritatis Splendor number 56 based on sacred scripture and on the tradition of the church that excludes a creative interpretation of the role of conscience and that emphasizes that conscience can never be authorized to le- to legitimate ex- can never be authorized to legitimate exceptions to absolute moral norms that prohibit intrinsically evil acts by virtue of their object. Benedict's response, yes. And his answer, the crisis of morality was chiefly the hypothesis that morality was to be exclusively determined by the purposes of human action that prevailed. Consequently, there could no longer be anything that constituted an absolute good, any more than anything fundamentally evil. There could be only relative value judgments. There no longer was the absolute good, but only the relatively better contingent on the moment and on the circumstances. But there is a minimum set of morals which is indissolubly linked to the foundational principle of faith and which must be defended if faith is not to be reduced to a theory but rather to be recognized <clears throat> excuse me but rather to be recognized in its claim to concrete life all this makes apparent just how fundamentally the authority of the church in matters of morality is called into question those who deny the church a final teaching competence in this area force her to remain silent precisely where the boundary between truth and lies is at stake, end of quote. Benedict's response ends the deafening silence with regard to the fundamental questions of faith addressed by the dubia. He answers them clearly and unequivocally. He knows the hour is late. Benedict warns us that, quote, the very faith of the church, unquote, is being called into question. Quote, it is very important to oppose the lies and half-truths of the devil with the whole truth. Yes, there is sin in the church and evil, but even today there is the holy church, which is indestructible. Today, God also has his witnesses, his martyrs in the world. We just have to be vigilant to see and to hear them. And that concludes the article by Elizabeth Mitchell. I'd like to thank Elizabeth Mitchell for her astute observations and for this incredible recognition 
and contribution. And that concludes our show for this evening. I'd like to thank all of you who might be listening tonight. I ask our Lord's abundant blessings upon you. And I ask Our Lady to enfold you in her holy mantle and to take you and to keep you in the refuge, the safe refuge of her most immaculate heart. May the Lord bless us, protect us from all evil, and bring us to life everlasting. Amen. Good night, and God bless. We hope you enjoyed the program, and will join us back for another show on WCAT Radio. This is Sebastian Mafud. Good day.